So um, this ad is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hi there, this is Robin Norgren, and I'm your host for Creativity Montessori and the Meaning of Life. You can find all of my information online on Instagram under at Robin underscore Norgren or over at, same place, Instagram, at UBU for Life. I'd like to start with some words from a book called Awaken by Priscilla Scherer. Give and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. Luke 6, 38. Ever since I was a little girl, our family summers have always included a week of church camp. Still today, with my husband and three boys, we load up the car and drive two hours into the wilds of East Texas for seven full days of water sports, late night ice cream sundays, and early morning trail rides on horseback. On the last day, we head out into the woods, sauntering to the easy gait of the horse's hooves, before dismounting at a cabin that's already awake with the luscious aromas of country breakfast and hot coffee. But before we go inside, there's one place we always go first. Perched around the wraparound porch is an old-fashioned pump where we can wash our hands from the dusty, grimy effects of our morning trail ride. It's the kind of vintage pump where you crank its metal handle up and down to get it started. But before any cool refreshment can start flowing out, we must first pour a quick stream of water in, a small container that brings nearby that hangs nearby provides enough to prime the pump with just this tiny amount of water the well from which it draws its deep supply starts to gush with more than enough water to wash our hands splash our face pat our sweaty necks and arms rinse off our dirty feet the water we invest comes back not in the same amount we gave it, but in more bountiful amounts than we even have the capacity to receive. Such is life in the kingdom of God. Not only is his nature one of lavish, unbridled generosity, but he often responds to the specific essence of our giving. Do not judge, Jesus said, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Not that we do our giving for the purpose of receiving. After all, the extravagant gift of His grace is more than reason enough for our undying gratitude and sacrifice. But when we give grace to others, we experience God's grace in even greater abundance. When we give kindness and mercy and unconditional love, His own love exceeds our investment and rejuvenates our soul. When we forgive others of the things they've done or said, we're able to relish in the full breadth of his forgiveness, covering sins we once doubted could ever be dealt with, much less washed away. Our God does not give to us in scanty, meager proportions, but in overflows, abundances, and excesses. He gives back much more than our meager outlay would merit, but he does it so that there's enough left over to spare, enough to prime the pump for the next go around. So give, even in your deficient places, especially in those places. Give even when what you're giving is more than you feel like you can afford. Remember, your God intends to return it all to you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. A 
Justin Kleong, in his book, Steal Like an Artist, says, Practice productive procrastination. The work you do while you procrastinate is probably the work you should be doing the rest of your life. Jessica Hish. One thing I've learned in my brief career, it's the side projects that really take off. By side projects, I mean the stuff that you thought was just messing around. Stuff that's just play. That's actually the good stuff. That's when the magic happens. I think it's good to have a lot of projects going at once so you can bounce between them. When you get sick of one project, move over to another. When you're sick of that one, move back to the project you've left. Practice productive procrastination. Take time to be bored. One time I heard a coworker say, When I get busy, I get stupid. Ain't that the truth? Creative people need time to just sit around and do nothing. I get some of my best ideas when I'm bored, which is why I never take my shirts to the cleaners. I love ironing my shirts. It's so boring. I almost always get good ideas. If you're out of ideas, wash the dishes. Take a really long walk. Stare at a spot on the wall for as long as you can. As the artist Myra Kalman says, avoiding work is the way to focus my mind. Take time to mess around. Get lost. Wander. You never know where it's going to lead you. Don't throw any of yourself away. If you have two or three real passions, don't feel like you have to pick and choose between them. Don't discard. Keep all your passions in your life. This is something I learned from the playwright Stephen Tomlinson. You can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. Steve Jobs. Tomlinson suggests that if you love different things, you just keep spending time with them. Let them talk to each other. Something will begin to happen. The thing is, you can cut off a couple of passions and only focus on, focus on one, but after a while you start to feel phantom limb pain. I spent my teenage years obsessed with songwriting and playing in bands, but then I decided I needed to focus on just writing, so I spent half a decade hardly playing any music at all. The phantom limb pain got worse and worse. About a year ago I started playing in a band again. Now I'm starting to feel whole. And the crazy thing is, rather than the music taking away from my writing, I find it interacting with my writing and making it better. I can tell that new synapses in my brain are firing and new connections are being made. About half the people I work with are musicians. And they're not all creatives either. A lot of them are account executives, developers, and the like. However, they all tell you the same thing music feeds into their work. It's so important to have a hobby. A hobby is something creative that's just for you. You don't try to make money off of it or get famous off of it. You just do it because it makes you happy. A hobby is something that gives but doesn't take. While my art is for the world to see, music is only for me and my friends. We get together every Sunday and make noise for a couple of hours. No pressure, no plans. It's regenerative. It's like church. Don't throw any of yourself away. Don't worry about a grand scheme or unified vision for your work. Don't worry about unity. What unifies your work is the fact that you made it. One day you'll look back and it will all make sense. Kelly Ray Roberts says in her book, Taking Flight, Fears are pesky and persuasive little buggers. If we're not careful, they help themselves to the creative landscape of our hearts, planting roots and spreading their tangled web of weeds all over our creative dreams. Tangled in the web are fears of falling, failing, losing money, not being inspired, and so on. 
Sometimes that web gets so dense that it's hard for our creative spirit to breathe, to dream new dreams, or to simply begin. Unknowingly, we give our fears that web of weeds more energy and landscape to grow upon every time we delay our creative longings. We convince ourselves that we'll get started on that creative project after we get married or after things settle down a bit or after the kids start school. I don't know about you, but it took me years to recognize this harmful pattern in my life. When we delay our creative yearnings, we, in essence, live in a world of procrastinating our creative truth because we are afraid of it. We may be, without even knowing it, continue to allow our fears and doubts to swallow our creative spirit. Perhaps this is where you are today, waiting, 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 for that perfect time that will never arrive. It's always hanging out there, like an elusive dangling reward that you can't even seem to reach. Eventually, we give up because that perfect time never arrives. And the truth is that it may never arrive. We'll never have enough money, enough time, enough support. And all of us, yes, all of us, will always have fears trying to keep our creative unfolding at bay. But here's the liberating and gentle truth. Your creative spirit is very, very forgiving. It doesn't care where you're going or how busy you are or if the house is clean or even if you're afraid. It just wants you to recognize it from where you stand today. Even with the hectic schedule, the overwhelming moments, the worries, and the ever-growing to-do list, we must embrace the idea that our creative dreams can begin from the very place we stand today. Not after this or after that, or when everything else in our lives lines up perfectly. I wrestled with my own fears, and still do, before I embraced the creative life. I worried that I had missed my opportunity and that I wouldn't be able to make a successful career move from practical social worker to artist. I had fears about whether or not my work would be accepted or if I had any natural talent. But one thing became clear to me as I wrestled with my doubts and worries. I must make a clear decision, a commitment to my creative wishes in order to see any potential progress. Just as with love, we make a decision about the kind of person we want to be with, I had to make a very clear decision about the kind of life I really wanted before I took real flight into my creativity. Wherever you are in your path, your creative bliss wants you to choose its spirit and give it a chance, to let its wisdom shine in your life. It's likely been standing in the shadows of all those practical fears, patiently waiting for you to notice, to allow it to step into the light. Sometimes making this choice can be daunting, a struggle between the heart and the mind. In the months before making my own decision, my husband and I moved to California. An Oregonian at heart, I wasn't thrilled to leave our home in Portland. But I took the move as an opportunity to embrace the idea of switching gears. I daydreamed about foregoing a full-time social work position and instead getting a part-time job so that I could focus on my art and perhaps sell it as a way to supplement our expenses in California. I thought to myself, why not? What's the worst that can happen? And this is when the real fears kicked in. I could fail. I could fall flat on my spirit and fail. I could give up a guaranteed income of a day job and risk everything. What if nobody bought anything? What if I wasn't good enough? Who did I think I was? I just started painting a few months ago. I wasn't ready. Could I handle the rejection? What will my family think? Should I be more responsible and in fact take a step in the opposite direction? Maybe even get two full-time jobs to help pay for my husband's tuition instead of being unrealistic about my lofty artistic dreams? Perhaps all this sounds familiar the endless sea of questions and fears that try to sabotage our creative whispers. Sometimes we just have to sit with it a while. 
and try to move and all sit with it all while we try to move forward with our dreams in spite of our fears. What small step can you take today? Could you perhaps create a small welcoming space in your home where you could spread out your collage materials, your scrapbooking papers, or your photographs? Remember, our creativity isn't asking for a bold leap into uncertainty. Often our largest fear of all, the one that keeps us from getting, it just wants us to take action in spite of our fears. Just a small step from where we are today. Nothing too intimidating.